This is a lecture session just looking at some issues related to hydrology and soils with an emphasis on the Ashfield Flats site. Um, and they're just really some things that we ought to be thinking about when we're considering how to interpret the data from your class project at that site. So just to put everything in context, we're sitting on the Swan Coastal Plain and the area where Ashfield Flats is really is occupied by a couple of different uh, geomorphic units, the Bassendine Dune system, which is the uh, yellow colour on the map here, and the Pinjara, which is uh, an alluvial recently deposited material uh, shown by the green colour on the map. And the soils that develop on these units really for the, the westernmost set of materials on the dunes, Quindalup, Spearwood, and the orange, and uh, Bassendine with the yellow, the, the sandy materials give rise to sandy soils. The Bassendines are the oldest of uh, a sequence of dunes that goes from west to east across the Swan Coastal Plain. And the Pinjara and the, the vast soils are more clay uh, sediments. Forest field uh, relates to what we call the Ridge Hill Shelf, um, and so uh, occupies a, a thin band, which uh, really is, represents an ancient coastline at the base of the scarp. Uh, and then on the Darling Plateau itself, we've got where the rivers and streams have incised and eroded into the Darling Plateau. We have the Murray Valley uh, landform and the Darling Plateau soil. So we have soils developed on ancient rocks and they don't, we're not really interested in, in those. It's the, the different types of coastal plain soils. Ashfield Flats is interesting because we have both the soils developed from windblown or aeolian material, the dunes, so they create the sandy soils to the north and west of the Ashfield Flats site. Uh, but a lot of the site is on material similar to uh, Pinjarra, so material which has been deposited, in this case, by the Swan River and formed different soils, uh, silty and more clay-rich soils as a result. So Ashfield Flats is... Um, we can just move me out of the way. There we go. Um, so it's a, a river flat area, the, the area that we considered um, it's surrounded by this uh, yellow polygon here is about 30 to 35 hectares. And, and we remember that it has some uh, permanent and seasonal water bodies in it, and they are important parts of the site. So it's not just older riverine or alluvial sediments that have been deposited here, but the topography being low and flat allows wetland ponds at least seasonally to exist, and they're shown with the light blue shading here. And the pink shows where the stormwater drains come through. Um, the Chapman Street drain running in, along uh, from the northeast to the southwest, um, and exiting in roughly the same place as the Kitchener Road drain does, which is on the western side of the site. Now, the, the Kitchener Street drain is pretty seasonal, uh, but there's water within the Chapman Street drain all the time. And just to remind ourselves, actually, that there's a, a branch drain which enters the wetland system uh, on the northwest of the site, just a minor drain, but it seems to be quite interesting in terms of its composition. Uh, some people might like to have a look at, at that. Anyway, so we've also got steeply rising relief. So once we're out of the, the flats area, we, we have relief of maybe five to 10 metres rising up uh, onto the Bassendine dune system. So within the polygon, pretty much all the Guildford uh, alluvial type of soils, but the Bassendine landform is surrounding it, so this part of the land is much higher, but there's a topographic and probably a groundwater gradient involved with that. Um, we have the Swan River estuary 
to the south, and we note that that's still tidal there. Uh, it's a reasonable way upstream, but we have enough tidal movement to have water uh, flowing uh, up the drains at a high tide, uh, as well as the flow continuing down the drains. And you'll be aware from your first group assignment of the potential for contamination, both historically and um, happening right now, from stormwater drains and old agriculture. And we don't need to go into the detail of that today. Right. So just reminding ourselves the surface geology. So this is the GeoView map. Uh, you can get to this. Uh, I think we've we've linked it on LMS somewhere. If not, um, we can do that. But this is what we call the state regolith map. Uh, it's a surface geology map. So the basically the material overlying uh, the bedrock below, and uh, what we have. In this diagram, let's make it a little clearer, is just alluvium. So then that's the, the detail to which the regolith geology map goes, in this case of uh, Cenozoic age, so somewhere between 1.8 and 0 million years old, uh, and the same with the Bassendine dunes on this side. They just call that sand plain in the regolith map. Right. OK, a bit more on that. So. Um, some of you may be aware of what the uh, surface geological cross-section of the Swan Coastal Plain looks like, but we'll just, for, for the next few slides, have a little look at that and outline some of the major issues. Um, so just a reminder that from the coast in the west, we have a series of dunes of increasing age. Uh, first of all, the Quindalup dunes, which are the ones right on the beach, kind of a grey, a limey sort of sand. They have a lot of calcite in it from shell fragments and things. And then the Spearwood dunes, those are the ones with the yellow sand that's often used as a building material in Perth. Um, and then we have the Bassendine dunes, which are older and more weathered, uh, and particularly the surface couple of metres of those is very, very intensely leached of just about everything. So there's a thin topsoil over all of these, and then the underlying material uh, really reflects the age. So the Bassendine dunes, are, uh, as we'll see a picture of towards the end of the presentation, uh, are very, very leached um, and pretty much only quartz sand. Yeah. Um, in the depressions between the old dunes, now remember that the, the Bassendine dunes are older, so the, the relief is lower than on the Quindlup and, and Spearwood systems because of erosional flattening of that landscape. But in the interdunes, so the, the, the low points, we often find wetlands and uh, we'll find wetlands as well, fringing the Swan and Canning River environments, um, and they're a different type of wetland. We can have a look at those types later on. So we've got this layer of Bassendine sand that will overlie some of the sediments below, uh, more clay sediments that may be derived from the Darling Scarp um, directly or indirectly from the action of rivers uh, for you know, many millions of years in the past. Uh, so here's our Guildford formation here, which extends off the Darling Scarp, and this is eroded and brought down by rivers. So the material that will erode from the mainly granitic rocks of the Darling Plateau will be quite rich in clay. And so the clay that comes into our alluvial sediments and the rivers that cross this landscape will come from the Guildford formation, either directly or it's being transported. All right. Um, slightly different way of looking at this, and this just goes a little bit deeper. Um, so the Bassendine dunes, as we've said, are overlying some of the alluvial material. But so the our Pinjarra Plain, which is, and again, it's um, riverine or alluvial material, sediments that have been deposited and just overlying um, other types of sedimentary rock in this case. Um, is itself overlain by the Bassendine dunes and then the spear would lap up onto those uh, and the quindalup onto those. Uh, spear would uh, and quindalup is where we find uh, exposure of limestone of course and that on the east is our Darling Plateau. The Ridge Hill Shelf, that old coastline which is quite old now, it's been very intensely weathered now. Um, there are swells associated with that 
but where we are in Ashfield Flats is on this Bassendine area with some of the Pinjarra Plain type material close to the river. All right, if we look at it in cross section, um, this is interesting because it, it discusses the groundwater in the system. So the, there are several aquifers in the system um, and they're held in place by relatively impermeable layers underneath. So as you can imagine, the Bassendine sand can hold a lot of water and the water table um, is five to ten metres below the surface in many areas, but much closer to the surface when we're near the river. So the groundwater at Ashfield Flats would be pretty close uh, to the surface. We, I, I don't have a feel for it. Uh, we may, I'm, I'll show you some data that Gavin uh, gave us and maybe a little bit more indication about how deep the groundwater is in some parts of the site from that. Um, Further down, we've got uh, the Mirabuka Aquifer, which was a confined aquifer sitting between uh, a shale and uh, what is that bit? The, the Poison Hill green sand. Okay, so the shale is the impermeable layer uh, beneath that. Um, I beg your pardon. The shale is underneath actually the uh, the Cardinia. There's another uh, mole cap green sand. So that these are glauconitic sands, um, marine sediments basically, which uh, are underneath the Bassendine system. And underneath that, we've got the uh, the large aquifers. Okay, um, and again, in more permeable material. So there's there's a lot of groundwater around. What we're really concerned with at Ashfield Flats is the shallow groundwater. Okay. Um, the groundwater that we, we're pumping at Nangara, but also uh, expresses itself uh, and it intersects with the water in the Swan River. Okay, now this block diagram, of course, is uh, really focused on something else, but uh, it gives a, a pretty good idea of the, the regional groundwater systems that are in place uh, at Ashfield Flats. Okay, now Ashfield Flats is a wetland environment. Uh, it wasn't super wet when we were there, but it is an, a wetland environment. And what we should be thinking about when we're considering wetlands are a few things. So there are flow regimes and sources of groundwater. And we get different types of wetlands depending on the source of the water. So for example, when we've mostly got wetlands fed by precipitation, uh, we have what we call a things like bogs, and there are some pocassins is a North American term, ephemeral wetlands, meaning those which are seasonal, they dry out um, in the dry season, and so on. Um, what we probably have uh, to some extent at Ashfield Flats is some, somewhere between a groundwater and surface water fed system. We don't actually know. Um, this diagram puts salt marshes, of which Ashfield Flats is supposed to be an example uh, as a high surface flow fed wetland, but we actually don't know the contribution of groundwater to the wetland systems there. So um, that's a question that needs to be answered. We, we won't obviously be able to answer it in our class project, but it's the kind of stuff that Gavin McGrath from DBCA is working towards with his research. Okay, um, so not the perfect diagram for our site, but it gives you an idea about what to consider. Where's the water coming from? Uh, and this is another diagram showing, um, this is from a, a report actually done a long time ago for, would you believe, the United States Army Corps of Engineers. Um, so it's a good summary of, of the geomorphic or landform approaches to describing wetlands. Um, what we have is what I would call, in some aspects, a fringing wetland system at Ashfield Flats. That is, it fringes a larger water body, that is the river. Okay, um, and in some respects, some of the wetland environments, the artificial ones in particular, the drains are what we call a tidal to fresh wetland. They will contain an interface of salt and fresh water. Um, but in other respects, I think some of the uh, wetland ponds are what we call a back marsh, uh, 
it is estuarine, but we've got uh, in that we've got a saline larger water body to consider. But we've got a bit of levying, both artificial and natural, on the foreshore, um, and then slightly lower elevation to form the wetland ponds a, a little bit further inland on that river margin. Okay, I, I don't think we we're in any of these other scenarios, but you might want to think about that. But that that's really a wetland geomorphology thing. The other really important things that we need to consider for your class project uh, are what are the relationships to groundwater in terms of flow and some of the other flow issues as well okay so there are there are three main categories i guess and they're not perfect because any wetland may operate under more than one of these flow regimes but we have inflow where groundwater contributes the most of the water to the wetland uh, by flowing up, meaning that we've got a groundwater gradient, the groundwater level, uh, short distances remote from the wetland relatively high, and therefore the, the hydraulic head pushes the water into that wetland from beneath, right? Land surface shown by the, the brown curve here and the dotted line is our water table. If we've got a water table that's decreasing uh, in height with distance away, from the wetland, then we probably have an outflow situation. Now we might move between these two extremes seasonally. So um, again, Gavin will figure that out, but we've, we've got a little bit of data to look at today. So you um, can do that. We're, there's also the possibility of through flow wetlands where we have high elevation of the groundwater um, upstream, if you like, uh, compared with downstream. So the groundwater inputs water to one side of the wetland and exits on the other. Uh, and that may be the case as well. Uh, we, we definitely have a groundwater gradient at um, Ashfield Flats, given the, the high uh, land to the northwest. So whether that's active or not, uh, we don't really know in terms of groundwater flow. Probably is in terms of surface water flow, because we know about that extra drain um, going in from the high ground. Uh, and so we should consider also um, different types of uh, flow direction. Okay, so the flow in a wetland system may just be up and down, uh, and so the, wet, the level in the wetland would go up from rainfall and other forms of precipitation, and down from evapotranspiration, probably mainly evaporation or or um, outflow. Okay, and that would, well, I don't know, that would be my guess about some of the, the wetland ponds at Ashfield Flats. Um, horizontal, uh, so unidirectional flow in one direction, um, we have, I think, in the upper reaches of the drains, they only flow in one direction, right? Uh, there may be flow occurring in the subsurface as well as the obvious flow on the surface in the upper reaches of those drains. When we were out there, they weren't flowing a whole lot, um, and that's a, a seasonal effect. So when there's significant rainfall, of course, those stormwater drains, which uh, have, in the case of the Chapman Street drain, quite a large catchment, um, they're going to be flowing quite obviously, um, and that may change the balance of flow. And right at the near the, the outlets of both of those drains, I think we probably have what we call bi-directional flow. So we've got inflow from the tide uh, and then the base flow of the drain pushing water back out again when the tide is low. All right, so all things to think about in terms of water movement and the, the hydrodynamics of the system, um, because th these are the sorts of background information that we're going to need to interpret the results that we have. All right. Okay, so um, we're getting towards the um, closing off this, so I told you it was going to be short. Um, hydrological measurements. So back to our, our map, what um, Gavin has done so far is now planning a much larger phase of research and getting the equipment in and stuff, but he actually ran what we call an electrical resistance tomography transect from uh, some of the high ground uh, and across the drain uh, and this is where the, the drain does that dog leg so 
apart from the high ground here, this is actually relatively flat topography. And um, the electrical resistance tomography basically puts a whole lot of metal electrodes inserted in the soil. And then we pass an electrical current uh, down there, pulse it uh, uh, and collect the signal from that uh, and the signal in particular between different electrodes. And the signal will respond mainly to the conductivity of the material that it's flowing through. Okay, so that means, uh, for example, wet soil material conducts electricity a bit better than dry soils and soils of different texture have different conductivities as well. Um, so the mathematics of it is pretty complicated. I've got no idea about it really. You should talk to Gavin if you're interested in this technique or you may have run one of these in another unit. Uh, I know Matthias Leopold is very keen on electrical resistance tomography as well. Um, but here's uh, the type of results that we're getting uh, and these have been interpreted uh, from the electrical signals in terms of the conductivity and the underlying material. So we, we're getting a signal um, in the middle of the transect down um, about, uh, I guess, 15 to 20 metres down. Right. So that's, that's uh, quite reasonable. It tapers off a bit at the edges because of the edge. You know, there's no electrodes further out to detect a signal, but you can get a little signal. So let, let's just unpack this. So just remember where the transect goes from the high ground where we've got houses and things uh, and coming down that relatively steep slope there and then across a relatively flat area of land where the, we've got that kink in the Chapman Street drain. All right, um, and this is where we park the cars and buses on the field trip, kind of in the middle of the transect. So you, you know this area, you sat there and had some food and conversation after you'd finished sampling. So we've got the pumping station there and so what we in, would interpret the, the red areas of low conductivity as a, probably of low water content. So really my interpretation is here is that we've got an impermeable uh, surface over the top of the underlying material, so the pumping station pad and uh, roads and things and house, houses sitting on top. Uh, so the, the material here is quite dry uh, and uh, one of Gavin's interpretations as well as this <laughs> fill material. Um, so again, has a different uh, hydraulic characteristics, maybe much sandier than the underlying material. And we've got the, the darker blue colours, that's where we have uh, wetter materials. Now, the, there's also some contrast due to different types of material, but we can see a, a linear feature lying just below the soil surface, perhaps, um, I guess my estimate is it's two or three metres down um, where we probably have the water table, right? Um, and there's water seems to be held up there um, compared to the material below. And that's often the case because it has a finer texture, so smaller particle sizes and smaller pores than the material below. And so Gavin's interpretation here is that they, this is where we've got a, a lens of mm. alluvial clays and silt, so quite fine material, sitting above a coarser material, or maybe a silty sand or something like that. Uh, we can also see uh, right where the drain is, we've got uh, wetter material, and that is um, seems to indicate a bit of downward movement. So. Uh, loss from the drain system into groundwater at, at this stage, maybe, maybe not. Um, and we've got the low-lying area being a bit wetter as well at the time of the year this was done. Right? This would have been um, in, in January this year, 2019. Right? So a lot of the wetland areas had dried out significantly more than that when we were there in March. Okay, so we can interpret that, uh, and one of the important consequences for us is that the, the water table heights about two or three metres below the surface in this part of the site. Now that may be quite different in other parts of the site, and I know that Gavin wants to kind of crisscross the area with 
more EIT transects to get an idea of what the groundwater is doing. Um, and one would guess that the groundwater would be uh, almost at the surface, uh, depending on the season, uh, in the very low lying points of Ashfield Flats, that's in the middle of the wetland ponds, whether they're seasonal or not. Uh, and there would be some intersection of groundwater, probably, um, at the drains um, and, of course, at the Swan River itself. Right, let's talk about soils or sediments for a little while. Um, now, this is not from Ashfield Flats. These uh, cores that you see illustrated on this slide are actually, they are Swan Coastal Plain, but this is down uh, near a stormwater drain at South Yunderup, just south of Mandurah. Uh, but I, I, I'm including this diagram because I think the, uh, the features will be similar. Uh, and what uh, I would focus on, I guess, is the, the contrast between slightly different environments, ranging from very black sulfitic material when we sample sediments underwater in the drains, and I think that's what you found at Ashfield Flats with the within drain samples, uh, to oxidised materials with no evidence of sulphides in them at all uh, for the I guess upland samples and the, the change in relief here is only uh, about um, a couple of meters right um, close to water bodies so like the drain and the wetlands what we see is uh, a, an oxidized and slightly clay soil material um, sitting over the top of reduced material where we see the dark sulfitic material at depth being dominant, then that probably represents the current height of the water table at the time of sampling. And of course, the water table is actually above uh, the, uh, the waterlogged sediments in the bottom of drains at all times. Uh, we did find one where the drain had dried out a bit, and of course the sediments at the top had um, oxidised a bit, so we don't have the, the dark black or grey coloured sulphide material in there. So I, I would imagine that this would represent something like the alluvial material at Ashfield Flats. Um, it's more clay, um, or it does contain sand. The, admittedly, the material in a lot of cases here is developed from dredge spores, a material that's actually in this case come out of the Peel Estuary. But I think we're uh, in the right ballpark in terms of uh, some of the textural characteristics of material. And if we went deep enough, um, and it seems like the water table depth at the top, two to three metres near the river, we don't really know. Um, eventually, we would probably get into some sort of sulphitic material. Okay, maybe. Um, it really depends on what was there initially. And then the drains, of course, where we've got lots of organic matter, um, sulphate from the marine environment, and... Uh, iron coming in from groundwater or stormwater, uh, we've, then we've got the iron sulfides in those drains. Okay, so the drain sediments themselves are probably quite good at capturing some types of contaminants. Maybe not nutrients, but I, I would guess that the metals get captured by those drain sediments reasonably well, as long as they don't dry out. And I, I don't think they would in the Chapman Street drain, but the Kitchener Road drain uh, had more relief along the length of the drain. And it's possible that some of those sediments may dry out seasonally, we're, we're not sure. And that would result in some oxidation and potential release of metals, which might be flushed out the next time it rains. We don't really know that, you know, it's all, I guess, at, at this stage. Okay. In contrast, the, the Bassendine sand material, um, so the upland material, would, if you dug deep enough into it, would look something like this. So the Bassendine sand, that's not the name of the soil type, they're often called Jandicott or Joel soils on the coastal plain, depends where you are. The Joels are the ones that actually often have wetlands on top of them or, or have had. Um, Jandicott, the more dry version, this looks like a Jandicott. So it, below a thin layer of topsoil with a bit of organic matter in it, um, and that's 20 to 30 centimetres deep, we have a, a very thick bleached horizon um, 
those of you who know a bit about soils will know that we call that an A2 horizon. It doesn't really matter. Um, what matters from the point of view of uh, understanding what might be going on on the upland environments at Ashfield Flats is that it's quite thick, so there's a lot of it. It's very sandy, and what that means is it's very low retention of nutrients and contaminants. So anything hitting the soil in the catchment, um, not necessarily down on Ashfield Flats, but the catchment of the drains, um, doesn't stay there very well. Okay, so phosphate and, and uh, different forms of nitrogen and metals and things will travel quite readily through this upper uh, bassendine material. They may stop, however, once they reach this B horizon. So that has, uh, we would call it a, a BSH for um, a B horizon with sesquioxides of iron and aluminium and H for humus, meaning the organic matter. Um, and that the different chemical properties of that material can allow it to trap some contaminants uh, from leaching. They, they may not though, because they may in highly contaminated environments become somewhat saturated. So uh, we, don't, we don't really know what's gonna happen. My guess is that we, if we drill down through this stuff, we'd find pretty low trace element contents in the topsoil and they would spike up in this iron rich material. That, that would be a pretty good uh, guess, I reckon, um, without having any data. Uh, and then we've got the original dune material, of course, below that, which in the case of the Bassendine material is uh, Pleistocene in the age. Um, and the best guesses are about between 0.1 and 0.8 million years old. So about 100,000 to 800,000 years uh, was the, the deposition of those dunes. Presumably the alluvial material on top of that um, at least some of it would, would be potentially a little bit younger because it's deposited on top or is eroded through the Bassendine material. But we don't really know that. There could have been you know, Bassendine alluvial interlayerings of that, especially when you've got 700,000 years to play with. All right, so those are some things that we need to consider. We've got contrasting soils and We've also potentially got a range of different hydrological conditions that might be operating. So um, we're going to leave that now, uh, and this will be a replacement for one of the lectures, obviously, that I missed. So thanks. <laughs>